know I'm so grateful for the anointing. A lot of people don't understand what the anointing is. and Really, I think the only religion on the planet that even talks about the anointing is the body of Christ. There's something about the anointing when it takes hold. You know, when you wake up in the morning and the only thing that was working right was the alarm clock. And you're wanting to go left and the rest of your body's wanting to drag itself right. Your voice don't want to quite work right. You wonder, how in the world am I going to make it through today? The anointing kicks in. Those of us in the fivefold ministry really... I think understand the anointing and appreciate it because when you feel the least likely, you feel the, the least of, that you want to do it, all of a sudden you begin opening up the word. I've stood behind this pulpit hurting so bad and so sick I couldn't hardly stand up. And the anointing hit. The moment the anointing hits, all the pain goes away. The sickness and disease leaves. Sometimes it leaves permanently. Sometimes it'll show back up about an hour after service, but you're glad that it was there. Uh, when you were ministering and God began to show you things that you never knew before. I want to deal this morning more on the anointing. We have been uh, dealing with new wineskins. We have uh, taken apart the, the brazen altar on the outside and the brazen laver. And this is our third week on the menorah. How many know there's a, a lot to it? We have dealt with the Messiah's anointing in Isaiah chapter 11. We've dealt with how that the only way that we can really walk with God is we've, we've got to learn to abide in Messiah. And that's encoded into the menorah. The ministries of the Holy Spirit are encoded in the menorah. And uh, how many know the ministries of the Holy Spirit are not necessarily what the, even most of the church says they are. They, they think the ministry of the Holy Spirit is to get everybody hooping and hollering and, and acting like wild squirrels. When the truth of the matter is, the Holy Spirit's here to straighten out your life, to give you wisdom, to convict you of what you need to be convicted of. And how I many know that's a good thing? If you're getting ready to head off a bridge that's out, it's a good thing to get convicted and turn back the other way. I want to deal this morning with a couple of things. And as, as we get into all this, we need to understand the pathway to menorah. The menorah is on the inner court. How I many know that without Messiah, without Jesus, you're not getting anywhere? We have a lot of people that try to do Hebraic heritage or Jewish roots without Jesus, and you don't go anywhere. I, I have spoken to a lot of rabbis that have found Messiah, and they said one of the things that they realized was it's, it's just a, a, you almost feel like a hamster on a wheel. You, you, you never get to the end. You, you never get to any goal. That's why the Apostle Paul said the end of the law or the goal of the law is Messiah. That when you get to that goal, everything changes. And the Word of God takes a new place. We also need to understand that the Holy Spirit flowing in our lives, it, He shows us the things that we need to put on the brazen altar and burn up. And let me tell you something. There's a lot of, we, we try to have a yard sale, and God says, you don't need to have a yard sale. You need to have a yard burning. <laughs> we don't want to share our things. But I, I want to deal this morning with the anointing. Because one of the things that I, I see is, as I speak across the body of Christ, people think that the only way to have access to the anointing of God is to be called to the fivefold ministry. And in a lot of churches, the way they do things, it, it almost seems that way. We, we have borrowed from the Catholic Church about how that we do things. And, you know, everything was the priesthood. And, in fact, only the priests were really allowed the word of God. There, were, there was a time in our Protestant history that people were burnt at the stake for simply having a Bible and dare have it in English or the common spoken word of that nation. You had to have it in Latin or some obscure thing that uh, no one spoke in. But I think God's giving us a new wineskin. Everybody in the body of Christ, you have an anointing. Just like those in the fivefold ministry, you have an anointing. And because we've never been told that, it never gets activated. How many of us found things in the Word that we didn't know that was there, but once you discovered it, you could begin applying it, and when you started applying it, it started working? Now, it had been there your whole life. Always sitting there, residing in the book. But until you discovered it, and the Holy Spirit made it alive to you, it didn't do you a bit of good, did it? And we need to understand in the, in the book that we hold, the Bible, 
people always just like to point out the sins. And how many know the sins are important? Why? Sins get you into trouble. Even when nobody else finds out about them, they get you in trouble. They will always set you on the wrong course. But you know that this is also a book of possibilities of what God wants to do in your life. I don't want to, you know, I'm, I'm 52 now, and as, as I'm, I got more life in, behind me than I do in front of me, and some of us have more than that, and Chuck laughs at me, you younger, you know, he said, oh, you young whippersnapper. Um, but I'm aware that I don't want to get into my old age and have a life full of would have beens, could have been, should have beens. I want to, I've been there, done that, got the t-shirt after the whole thing was over. I actually did something with my life more than just take up space, breathe air, and eat food. I want to do more. And you see, the government can't give that to you. In fact, really, even the people around you can't give that to you. Only God can give that to you. And so I, I want to just really begin to understand the anointing. Has anybody ever gotten a bottle of olive oil? How many know that's kind of the base ingredient for anointing oil? Sometimes you can use almond oil. And uh, I take a lot of different oils for my health, and a lot of them will come from nuts, you know, walnut oil and, and different things. Do you know a way that you can get to that oil is that thing's got to be crushed? And we want to get to the anointing without some crushing going on in our lives. I remember years ago I heard T.D. Jakes preach, and this one guy came up and said, oh, Brother Jake, Jakes, I want your anointing. I, I, I just want your anointing. He says, you don't want my anointing, son. I want your anointing. You really want my anointing? Yes. Lord, let him not have any money. Let him walk five or six miles to church every week to preach to the three or four that show up and walk back. Let him not have the money and have his electric lights turned off year after year after year. You see, I know some folks that knew T.D. Jakes when he was preaching back in, in, in uh, I think it was South Carolina. West Virginia, that's it. And uh, he preached to the same four, five, six people year after year. He had his electricity turned off many a time. Many a time he didn't know if he was going to have food to put on the table or not. He went through the school of hard knocks. And in that crushing, released an anointing in his life. And we look at now that the anointing is released and we say, I want that, but I don't want the other. You can't have that. When I start walking with God, it doesn't mean that, that, all, that everything's going to be rainbows and unicorns and butterflies. It means that he's with me, and as he's walking with me, and as I so learn to surrender to him in the crushing of the carnality of my life, an anointing can begin to flow. If you have your Bibles, I want to go to Matthew chapter 21, verses 42 through 44. And there's a lot in this. I could actually take this and do an entire series just from these few verses. But I want to center it on, we need to learn to fall upon the stone that the builders rejected. Jesus saith unto them, did ye ever read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner? This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore I say unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. And whosoever shall fall on this stone will be broken. How many know that's where we are right now in history? You have a chance to fall on the stone to be broken so that the anointing can be released. There's a song that we, talk, that we sing talking about Jesus that he was broken and poured out. I think of the alabaster box that anointed the Messiah. How many know that that alabaster box had to be broken open before the anointing oil could be released? And on the inside of every one of us, there's an anointing to be released. And sometimes it was established by the very things that you may have went through in your life. It's amazing to me the people that go through the hardest times, once they get a hold of Jesus, have the greatest hope to share with others. There, there, is, there are very few, let's say, uh, shelters that, that help abuse women that were not established by abused women who found hope in Christ. There's very few shelters that feed the homeless that the ministers at one time were not homeless. 
that what God delivers me from when I surrender to him and that surrendering and falling upon him in humility, there is a brokenness that allows a releasing in my life of an anointing to help others find the exact same thing that I found. Oh, if we could just grasp that. You know, they, they say in psychology, hurt people hurt people. But what I have found is restored people restore people. That once I let him touch my hurts and, and heal my wounds, then I become a restored restorer. But the last half of 44, we're getting very close to, how many know we're at the end of days? I just don't really see how much longer this old globe can spin without something really funky happening. I mean, when you look at everything that's going on worldwide, <laughs> there's a lot of funk going on. You know, There's a lot of junk. It's, it just don't smell right. You know something's up. The whole world is being positioned for something, and it's not good. It's the rays of the Antichrist. It's the, the rays of a system. You know, we may be very, the, the whole world is going socialistic. You know what that really says? You can't own property. You can't own anything. You don't even own the very thoughts in your head. They better line up with the state. I think sometimes in seminary we need to have as a required reading 1984 because we're headed there in a real way. But this world is going to have to answer those who will not fall upon Messiah and be broken to come in humility saying, I need you. When he comes back, he'll grind to dust. We celebrated that this fall when we celebrated a recognized. Tell me know that you don't celebrate the Day of Atonement. You recognize it and you celebrate that you survived it. If you really understand the feast. My, you know, there has never been a sunset on the, on the feast of, on the Day of Atonement that my whole family says, woohoo, we get to fast for a whole 24 hours. I remember when we first started doing it. Do you know what adds to it? You end it with, with a big meal. So the whole next day that you're fasting, the smell of food fills your whole house. God says, you need to humble yourself and walk with me and yield to the process. That's what's coming. But it's amazing to me how God unites things together. I'm, I'm going way off course with my sermon, but this is okay. We have the Feast of Trumpets. The Feast of Trumpets is a dress rehearsal for the rapture. But I'm, I'm sad to report from what I can see from Scripture, you get, to, you get out of about 10 days of the tribulation period. 10 days. Between trumpets and the Day of Atonement. But you know what's happening during those 10 days as this world's getting ready to answer to its God? How long is a Jewish wedding feast? 10 days. We're taken out of here because we've got a wedding feast to go to. And we're preparing while they're refusing to prepare. They refuse to bow down. They're like the tares. How many, how many remember the story of the tares and the wheat? Do you know how you can tell the difference between a tear and a wheat? They look identical until it comes harvest time. And wheat bows down in humility because it has fruit. It, 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 it's, the head will, will bow down or the load of that. A tear has nothing, so it just stands straight up. It refuses to bow. I want to look at what Dake says about this. When he says, for, whom, uh, for whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken, but upon, and, but upon whomsoever it falls shall be grounded in powder. Whoever throws himself on the mercy of Christ shall be broken and made contrite. Isn't that true? When you really come to grips with Jesus, you realize you couldn't do it. Your track record's not good enough. That you couldn't stand before a holy God with your record. Come on. So we've got to throw ourselves on the mercy of the court. Throw ourselves on the mercy of the cross. But whosoever rejects his mercy shall be completely crushed and be scattered like chaff. I would rather be broken than crushed. How about you? Because in the brokenness, God can begin to flow out. Now, I want to show you a picture here of the menorah of the seven anointings. And how many know we, you can't deal with the menorah without dealing with anointing because it's full of oil. 
that's what gives it its flame. Now, traditionally, we always look at the five-fold ministry of the apostle, the prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher, and we think that's all the anointings that there are. Once again, we borrow that from the Catholic Church that, that the priesthood has everything and they've got the secret sauce and nobody else can get it. When in reality, in Ephesians chapter 4, the Apostle Paul says the fivefold ministry is here to prepare you for your ministry. We're your coaches, we're your mentors. And so everybody's trying to get to the anointing and they say, well, the only way I can get there is if I'm called to this. And we even have a lot of ministers that don't understand that we as individuals walking with God, we have an individual anointing that we can work on and learn how to flow. And I have, guys, I, I have, I've been in ministry a long time. My own family can tell me, can testify to this in times past, that if you don't develop your individual anointing, your ministry anointing can be way up here. And so you get in the pulpit and that ministry anointing goes way, way up here. And you step out of the pulpit, and it's like stepping off a cliff. My wife used to tell me, she said, you know, I really fell in love with the guy behind the pulpit. It's just the guy coming home with me uh, after church every week I got a real problem with. Because it was a different anointing, and I always worked to develop this anointing, and I was never, ever taught to develop the other one. Now, those in the fivefold ministry, the apostle, and how many know that we really need apostles today? Because apostles establish both vision and doctrine. And what I'm seeing right now in the body, the body needs a good establishing of doctrine again across it. We have some of the craziest things that I have ever seen being taught from pulpits today. And what really amazes me is those things get the money to be on satellite television. And the more, that I, the more that I pray about it, the more that I, that I just meditate on it, I say, God, what's really going on with this? And he said, did I not say it was, you know, Elijah was going to have to return before I come back? It, John the Baptist had the anointing of Elijah upon him. And the two, pro, the two prophets we'll see in the book of Revelation are going to have the anointing of Elijah on them. Well, you can't have that anointing coming without having the opposite. You see, in Elijah's day, all the true prophets were living in holes. Well, all those who had the biggest donkeys and had the biggest homes were the ones sitting at Jezebel's table. There's something to make you ponder. Because I'm, 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 I'm watching these huge crowds, and they're cheering about doctrines like, because of grace, you can sin and do anything you want to. It's okay. I heard one very prominent minister, he come this close, guys, to saying that Satan and demons could be redeemed too. And I'm thinking, and you got a dollar. Somebody gave you money to preach this stuff. But the Bible says in the last day there'll be those that have itching ears. They, they want to, oh, the flesh is okay. No, it's not. It'll kill you. How many of us have, have been our own worst enemy? One of my favorite quotes from one show that didn't make it, but the, the guy was having problems with himself, and he failed when he needed himself the most, and he was sitting at the table saying, why, where was I when I needed me the most? And how many of us have felt that way, that when I really needed to walk spiritually with God, the old flesh rose up instead of the real me, and I end up doing the very thing that brought me harm or brought problems in my life? When I really needed the me who is redeemed to stand up and take supremacy and say, I'll not do this, I choose righteousness. And right now we have, we have a church that's going amok because we don't have any real apostles. Apostles establish doctrine. And doctrine is not something you post on the wall. Doctrine is something you live. We need prophets. Prophets give adjustment and correction. If you ever done a building project, there's always an inspector come along. He's the guy that he, he, he takes the plumb line, boom. No, you're going to have to rebuild that wall. You're half a degree off. How I many know that if you're going to build something over one story, that's kind of handy? Or checking the foundation to see if it'll hold up. How many believers' lives have not held up? That's why the Bible says that if we, if we yield to the prophets, 
everything's going to be, there's a blessing with that because they'll check your foundation and say, this thing will crumble on you if you're not careful. Evangelists call people in. We always, we always look for signs and wonders. Signs and wonders best manifest around evangelists. Believers don't need signs and wonders. You serve the God who is the God of wonders. You don't need them to get your attention. He already, he already has your attention. It's for the lost that don't know him. In fact, I believe God's best in your life, guys, is that you'll never need a miracle if you're walking in God's best. A miracle is a divine catch-up of what you should have been if you were doing what you should have been doing to begin with. You know, somebody needs healing. Well, you got to overcome 30 years of abusing your body. How many know you might need healing? But what happens if you hadn't abused your body for 30 years? You'd be in a position not to need healing. Isn't that a better position to be with God? The pastor, and everybody loves the pastor. Turn to your neighbor and say, Mike Lake isn't one. I'm not a pastor. I'm an apostle. I'm a teaching apostle, and I can teach forever. Uh, how many of you will testify to that? The pastor protects men's and comforts. I like what Peter Martinez said, too. The pastor's job is to get that sheep as he's petting on it. He gets it into a headlock as the prophet or the apostle shows up and says, it's going to be okay. <laughs> and this loves on them as they get correction. The teacher gives instruction. And we have a, a lot of things that sound good from the pulpit. I have seen people that cheer and get up and the, I'm anointed and they just jump up and down and they do all these crazy things at church and then they leave and they have no instruction on how to really do anything in life. Instruction from the word is what you do after you leave here so that you walk yourself into something better with the hand of God in your life. And that's really what that anointing is about, is God has given us an anointing to live if we will begin yielding to it, that you have an anointing in you, resonant in you, that when you receive the instruction of God's word to help you do what God said to do. Sometimes we can call that anointing grace. Grace is not the excuse to sin. Grace is the ability of God not to sin to hold on to that which the world says you cannot hold on to. We find out we can. Mary and I have been in situations in the past that our flesh, now see, see if you can identify with this. Someone's coming at you and they're not being too Christian. Especially if you're ex-military. <laughs> you, you want to, oh, let me show you how I feel. <laughs> No, you don't really want to know how I feel in this moment. And all of a sudden, this grace comes on you. Instead of yielding to the flesh, you begin showing them the love of God. When you really would like to bop them upside the head two or three times, you don't do that. You choose to yield to the Spirit of God on the inside of you, and God gives you the grace to do that which in your flesh is impossible. You smile, you be cordial, and you begin sharing the love of Christ with them. That's grace. Grace is also walking up to a situation that it's impossible for you to survive through. And the anointing of God comes on you, and you may be in the valley of Jehoshaphat, and God says, this begin worshiping me. And when you do, confusion comes to the enemy. Grace is what put the rock in David's sling. Come on now. Grace is what flowed out of him whenever he picked up a harp and began to sing that would even cause demons that were troubling the king to be silent. That's true grace, and that's an anointing that we have resident on the inside of every one of us. We also have a priesthood. We've been talking about the priesthood. What's interesting when you study Torah, and all these guys had to build all this stuff, the Bible says that God placed an anointing on them that they would have wisdom beyond themselves so that they would begin building things perfectly, exactly the way that God said it was to be. Now, Chad and Roma, they've been in Israel, and he shared something interesting with me about the menorah. And I've already shown the, the, the one they have out in the courtyard. It's in a big glass case. 
It's as an exact replica as close as they can get it to the one that Moses made. But there's a difference to it. You can't make it out of pure gold and it not fall in on its own weight. You know, its arms start going like this. But Moses did. They tried. Didn't work. They tried again. Didn't work. That one there is gold-plated. <laughs> because, I mean, gold is a soft material. Even, even the rings we use for wedding rings, you don't want really more than 14 karat gold. I've seen some guys, you know, I'm going to get a school ring and I want it 18 karat gold. Ten years later, it's a blank because you can't even tell what they, where they graduated from because it's such a soft metal. And so here you have this huge heavy thing. You have it full of oil and the weight of the oil. And then a soft metal, gold will melt. And then you have these big flames coming out of the top of it. And the thing stays together. It's intact. Its arms don't start going like this <laughs> when you light it up. And right now there's not an anointing on any of the craftsmen in Israel to figure out how that they did it under the anointing of God. Say, Mike, why'd you bring all this up for? Because there was an anointing on them when they built it. How many know God's requiring us to build a life? God wants us to have a good life. One better than what we came out of. How many know that the hope of every parent is that their children have a better life than they did? Now, we can wish that, we can hope that, or we can work with God for a strategic plan to begin making it happen. And it happens because you begin working with God. And God says, study this, do this, invest in this. And as you become obedient to God, God begins to position you. And it doesn't happen overnight. We're in, we're in a world of microwave everything. Everybody just wants the heavens to open and God just give you a lotto ticket. How many know sometimes getting a lottery ticket that wins is the worst thing that happens for a lot of people? They end up in divorce and bankruptcy within two or three years. I've seen people go through $25 million, and I'm thinking, man, that's enough for a couple of lifetimes. But they go through it, and then somehow or another, they spend all the money, but yet they owe all the money, and everything gets repossessed that they had cash to buy with to begin with. Now, how do you do that? No planning. You weren't in a position to handle that. So God, he, he's got to adjust us and allow us to begin to move and, and to establish some things in our lives. Some of us, were looking at school, what we're going to do with school. God's got to give you the right school. I mean, no, you can actually study the right subject at the wrong school and never achieve anything because you're going to get the wrong teachers that are barely going to teach you the subject instead of getting you to, to ignite your imagination and to ignite that anointing. So even knowing where to study is important. God leads us. Guys, there's several things that God wants us to do. Number one, we've got to realize an anointing is available for you. In your priesthood, that in your own lives, everything that I've been teaching about the, the tabernacle within, God's going to show you how to build in your own life. Because where we're, where we're trying to get is the throne of God. We're trying to get to the Ark of the Covenant. Because if you ever really found out what was in the Ark of the Covenant, you'd want it. You'd want that in your life. But we've got to realize that it's available for us. And it's not all about the church. What, what I was sharing at the beginning of the series, this is not about being church-centric. It's about being individual-centric and the church empowering you so that you can walk this thing out so that if this thing ceases to exist, you're okay and you're still walking with God. Guys, we have got to have that. Why is everything church dependent? Because, well, you, you look back at the Catholic thing, and that, that kind of worked well. But at the same time, uh, a lot of ministries, if you don't keep buying their new CDs and their DVDs and, and all their, and their new books and everything, they can't pay the bills. And, 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 and uh, there's nothing wrong with coming out with DVDs. We come out with them all the time, give them away. Come out with CDs, put it free on the Internet. Nothing wrong with books. I just don't want to build some monster that I've got to believe God for two, three million dollars a year just to maintain, or months just to maintain. You know, there are ministries today that if they brought in three million dollars this month, they're in trouble. I can't 
fathom that. I can't fathom that. Well, Mike, don't you want that? No. <laughs> I don't. I would rather be just exactly where God wants me to be. I travel 12 times a year. I don't want to travel any more than that. I could. I don't want to. I'm getting too old for that. That's why I do DVDs. I just mail them the series. <laughs> Put me on the big screen. I don't want to have to travel all the time. Not until they develop transporter beams and just beam me someplace. I, don't, I hate the travel. The older I get, the more I hate it because the more gripes on me as I'm traveling. And for some reason, the jets keep getting smaller and I keep getting, well, that's a whole other story. Um, but we, the happiest we're ever going to be is exactly where God wants us. And where Chuck would be happy would be different than where I would be happy. Or any one of us. We each have our own unique position, and the job of the church is to get you walking with God so that you can walk into your destiny and find fulfillment. You can, you can be raised in a good home, have money, and marry the wrong woman and be miserable the rest of your life. Or you could be poor and marry the right woman and feel like a millionaire your whole life. Decisions. God placing us strategically in the right position. We've got to seek the face of God for the releasing of these two anointings. Father, I want, to, I want the anointing to live so that I'm positioned in the right places because, guys, we're going to have to depend on that in the days to come. Right. You're not going to be able to depend on the government. What happens one day when there's a switch flipped and the government becomes the oppressor? How many know we're really not that far away from it right now? Just look at the inheritance tax. Now, somebody paid taxes on that their whole life, sometimes two or three times, paid taxes on it. Then they leave it to you, and the government says, now, not only did I get taxed on that my whole, the, the whole life, but I now want 55% of that myself. So when it's all said and done, the government got about 90 to 95% of that money before it was passed down to you in reality over the years. See, there's a, there's a small switch, and it, it's being that way that what used to be established for peace, the United Nations, is now working to become the oppressors of the world, trying to get nations to sign treaties. Do you know a treaty, if it's ratified by our government, it's higher than the Constitution, the treaty comes first? And some of the nonsense... There's the spirit of oppression. The only way to, to step outside of that is I can't trust in that system. I've got to trust in God. I've got to have a different anointing. I've got to have a different attitude in life. I've got to learn to flow with something different. That's what all this is about. When I understand I have an anointing to live outside of Babylon, I have an anointing to live outside the world system, that I can be in the world, but not of the world, if I learn to flow in the kingdom of God. And that I have a priesthood. Every believer has a priesthood. Through the cross, God went back to plan A. When Israel rejected the voice of God, God said, I would that you would have been a nation of priests, but because you were not, I choose out the tribe of Levite for myself. But then through Jesus, he goes back to plan A. We are a royal priesthood, a holy nation. Yet the way we have done church, I'm the priest and you're not. How many know that's just wrong? Men, you're the priest of your household. Women, you're the priestess of your household. You need to flow with God the way that God's called you to. You need to learn how that in your own life you can have every vessel that's in the tabernacle built within you so that when you need to, you can take care of the flesh, you can get the wisdom of God, and you can walk into the very throne room of God and to get the fire of the presence of God, his provision, his leadership, and his commandments in your heart. That's what all this is about. I want to go to Jeremiah chapter 1, or Joshua chapter 1, I'm sorry, verses 7 through 9. I want to show you the... the strategy of the enemy. How many know that every charismatic on the planet is kind of like Jacob before he wrestled with God? Every single one of them. I just want a blessing. 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 And they fall for the guys on TV and say, send me $500, you'll get blessed. How many know most time out of that equation, which one got blessed? 
the guy that had the P.O. box or whatever. We're so desperate for a blessing because our theology has, has taken away from us the very avenue to get blessed. And so we, we get into Gnosticism, we get into chicanery. How many know that doesn't belong in the kingdom of God? I want to, show, I want to teach you this morning how to get, begin getting blessings in your life. And as you begin to successfully do this in your life, God will slowly begin establishing you and turning things around. How many know that you may not have walked in this situation you're in right now overnight? It took you a while to get there. And if you turned around today and begin walking the other way, it's going to take you a while to walk yourself out. But at least now you know the path to get out. And why is that so important? It becomes a testimony. It doesn't come, Brother Chuck, it doesn't come down to this. You need to wait for Brother so-and-so to have the white whammy on him and the right anointing on him, and when he comes, you're all right. How many of that's kind of vaporous? That's kind of, I found Jesus. I crucified the flesh. His blood covered my sins. I got into the book, and God said, do it this way, and I don't understand necessarily why he wanted me to do it that way, but I began doing it simply because he said to, and as I did faithfully what he told me to do, I began to walk my way out. Here is his instructions. If you do it the same way I did it, I guarantee you it will work for you. Nobody has ever went humbly to the cross and not walked away saved. It'll work for anybody. Come on. It'll work for anybody. All of God's wisdom will work for anybody if they begin yielding to it, submitting to it, humbling themselves, being broken before him, and simply doing what he said. Now, I want to set the stage here for Joshua. I can't imagine taking the reins of leadership from Moses. Have you read Exodus? They didn't like it. They rose up to try to kill him. God would hit them with plagues. The next morning, they got mad at Moses because of all the people who died the day before when they went against him, and God killed them all. I'm thinking, God, why don't you just make him 20 again? Let him take this thing back up again. I'm just, I'm just willing to hold his coat forever because if they ever come to kill him, they never come, at, come after the dude with the coat. I'm just holding his coat, you know. They murmured, they complained about everything. They complained about divine provision, manna. They complained about this, they complained about that. They had shoes that were out and they're probably complaining, yeah, but that was last, last decade style, you know. It's not fashionable now. Did you see what the Philistines were wearing? And I got to wear these old things and, and I tell you what, they never wear out so that I can believe God for a new pair. I mean, griping about everything and then if they didn't like something, the first thing, let's kill the preacher. Let's kill him. Yeah, God didn't watch him today. Let's get him. Come on. I'm thinking, no, I'll sing in the choir, Lord. I am not going, I, I, no, don't give me no stick. I don't want no stick. I don't care if it parted the Red Sea. I don't want it because I don't know if it's going to work for me. I picked it up a few times, and I, I couldn't even get my bowl of water to part, you know, and then you want me to take this thing? This is what God shares with him, starting in verse 7. Only be thou strong and very courageous. I mean, God, God had to speak with him about this because of the position he was in. He had to deal with the people, and instead of God giving them everything hand over foot, he was saying, now they got to go, and for the first time in their lives, they're going to have to fight and believe that I'm going to anoint them to fight. Be courageous. Yeah. Be strong. Oh, Lord, help me be strong. That thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded thee, turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. That. That ends up being a big word. It's a four-letter word, that. Believer, why aren't you having more blessing in your life? It may be that you're not doing anything that God's told you to do. Well, I got grace. I don't have to do the commandments. Then go without blessing. It's all your fault. Just go without blessing. And run from charlatan to charlatan, even the ones that have a talking mule, and try to get something to get blessed. Or 
you can learn to walk with God. And as you do the word, God systematically begins to prosper you because you're doing the things that work in the kingdom and the commandments always work in the kingdom. Guys, I want all of us, I'm tired of running after a blessing. That's not God's best. God told Abram, I'm going to bless you and make you a blessing. I'm supposed to be the blessing, not run after one. But as I yield to him, I have an anointing to learn the commandments of God. I have an anointing to activate the commandments of God. And I have an anointing to do the commandments of God. No wonder the devil hates the commandments and have tried to disenfranchise the church from them because in doing so, he took away our blessing. This one scripture, I can replicate over and over and over and over and over and over again throughout the word. This is not just picking out one verse. It's over and over and over again. Anybody ever read Psalms chapter 1? Don't be like those in Washington, D.C. and the scoundrels and the whatever, the power hungry. Those who don't walk with God. But meditate in his commandments day and night. And you'll be like a tree that even in the midst of a famine you'll not wither. Whatsoever your hands find to do shall prosper. But I'd just rather give and, 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 and believe for a blessing that I don't have to work. I don't, I don't have to work. I don't have to do anything. You have the power of God in your hands. One of the things the rabbis got right now, when you get into the rhythm of the Sabbath, six days I continue the creative process of God in the earth. God gave it to me and said, now go ahead and expand on this thing. Take dominion. So I am creating, I, I, I am creating wealth or I'm creating blessing for somebody. I'm creating something, whether it's building something with a hammer or whatever I'm doing. I, I'm doing something. I'm creating. And God says, when you walk with me, that won't be a curse. It'll become a blessing. And then I rest on the Sabbath day to remember who it all came from. Let's go on. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do all that is according, all that is uh, written therein. Now, they always had to meditate. How many know read meditating on the words good? Very, very important. But you got, you got one up on Joshua. The Holy Spirit moved on the inside of you. He wrote the commandments of God on your heart. What you're doing as you're meditating on this is you're getting your head catching up with your heart. Because where we mess up in our prayer life is our head says one thing and our heart knows another. And our faith cannot be released when our heart is at odds with our head. You don't prosper. It doesn't function. You're praying this beating the air because your heart cannot release faith when your head is wrong. And I don't care how long it's been wrong. It may have been wrong for the last 70 years. That does not make it any more right. It just means you have been wrong for a very, very long time. And it has never worked. What makes you think it's going to work now? But when I allow God to change my mind by meditating on his commandments, my mind and my heart come together in agreement and any time they come into agreement, faith is released for the impossible. That's what this is talking about here. Activating it to where a man's head is re-educated to live according to his heart because that's where the Holy Spirit moved and the Holy Spirit wrote all the things that I've been reading in here about the commandments of God. Those are written like, like in granite in my heart by the finger of God. And so every time that you pray, your heart looks at what's written on it compared to what your mind is believing for. Or you start to go do something, and your heart is saying, I can't release an anointing for that because it's not in alignment with the Word. I, guys, I, I've become big on, on things like integrity. You know, the Bible says a man will swear to his own hurt. You know what that means? If I've given my word on something and the situation changes and it even costs me, I'll still keep my word. 
Well, I don't see how that's biblical. God told Adam and Eve in the garden, I'll fix this. Did it cost him? You messed up, but I'll fix this. God swore to his own hurt. It cost his son. That's our example. When I'm walking in the kingdom, I know that when I keep my word, the power of God is there to make up the difference. Guess I ought to show you the scripture, shouldn't I? I've been so busy preaching, I'm not flipping screens. But I love this. Look, repetition in the Hebrew is significant. It's bringing attention to something. Meditate on my word so that you prosper. Meditate on my word that you may prosper. That the book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous. Thou shalt make thy way prosperous. You don't need to have God come in and to hit you with a whammy to make your way prosperous. You, because you're flowing with the kingdom, the decisions that you make today set you up for prosperity tomorrow. Or on the other hand, the fleshly decisions that you make today rob your blessing tomorrow. That's why we need God's commandments. That's why we need that anointing. Thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. If you run down a prophet and give him a certain offering on a certain day where he's promised you seven angels. Guys, I, I have seen everything. There, there, there's one ministry, and I'm not even going to name it, that, that found an ancient stone where they used to make bread. Well, it was from the Holy Lands. And so what we have done is we have used one of these stones to grind the wheat. And we have baked this wheat. And we have baked bread in this ancient oven. So that if you send in your offering to us, we will send you $200 or more. How many know that's expensive bread? We will mail you a loaf of bread baked in this oven. And you will be guaranteed as you open this up, all these blessings are going to come to your house. That's what was going on with the Greeks and the Romans and that's Gnosticism. You won't make your way prosperous. This is how Mike Lake does it. I repent of the stupid stuff that got me out of the blessing. I run to God and I say, are you ready? I'm sorry. I know that's hard for men to say. I'm sorry. I messed up. It wasn't the universe. It wasn't my mom and dad. There went Freudian theory right out the window. It was me, me, myself, and I. I did it. I was wrong. I repent. Forgive me. Let the blood of Jesus cleanse this thing. And you know what? Now I'm going I'm to do a 180. I'm going to start doing just the opposite. I'm going to start lining up with your word. And even though my flesh doesn't want to do it, and it may cost me, I'm going to do the word, and I'm going to do the word. And if the flesh cries out, I'm going to crucify it, and I'm going to do the word. And what I find is I walk myself right back into a place of blessing. That's how I do it. And it's worked for me. And I can give you a 100% guarantee it'll work for you if you do it with an honest heart. Just go to God's word and do it his way. Really easy. Because it was written by someone who has an IQ of about 6 million on a bad day. <laughs> who can take a grain of sand and balance the earth and balance the universe. He can take a drop of water and balance all the oceans and the seas. Can fly this universe into existence. And you know that astrophysicists tell us that the way that the entire universe is laid out, not just our galaxy, but the entire universe, the way it's laid out, is laid out in such a way that all the magnetic forces are perfect for life to exist on this planet. This getting a little bit in, in, into... Uh, astrophysics. These guys understand this stuff more than I do. They look at all the math and they say, if, if this quasar wasn't over here and this, and this other black hole wasn't here and this one wasn't here, that the magnetic forces would not be right so that when this planet was this far away from the sun and just right, that life could be maintained on this planet. 
God balanced the entire universe to include when we have sons going nova and new sons being born, yet it keeps everything in balance to keep life on this planet. Guys, some days I have a hard time keeping my balance to walk across the room. And yet I'm serving a God who can do all that and says, here are my ways. You tap into wisdom that's beyond your ability to understand. But God says you don't have to understand it. You just have to have faith and do it. And when you have faith and do it, obedience is always better than sacrifice. He doesn't stop there. Have not I commanded thee, be strong and of good courage, be not afraid. Neither shalt thou be dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee wherever thou so thou goest. I want to end with this. If you don't understand the anointing and the purpose of being broken before God, you're going to walk into situations that God is not with you. Now, how many know that, you know, well, doesn't the Bible say God will, you know, I'll be with you forever and, and all this stuff to the end of the age? There, how many know God's presence, he knows everything that's going on in every single square inch of the universe, and he's there. But there's a difference between him being there and manifesting his presence. You see, as a parent, you can watch a child playing and everything, and, and there have been parents that have sat by and just let their kids get hurt when they knew better. It's not a perfect world. But that doesn't mean that that parent's presence wasn't there. But what manifests the presence of that parent when it reaches out and stops the child or stops the dog from biting or whatever, it's the manifested presence of the authority. I want God's manifested presence with me. So that when Satan has a dragon that needs to be slayed, God turns to me and says, pick up that sword and strike him down. My hand will be with you. There's a giant. Pick up a rock. Lord, I'm looking for the bazooka. No, a rock will do. And let the anointing fly through what I've given you. Now, if you didn't write that down, you've missed the whole point of everything. What God has placed within your hands, his anointing is all you need to make it work. I don't know about you, but I'm after the anointing. It's not locked into the five-fold ministry. We're here to help you activate your anointing. Now, that may be to the shock of a lot of the five-fold ministers out there, but our job is to get you to loose your anointing so that you can bring peace in your household, so that you can bring healing into your household, so that you can watch God take your finances and take a little bit and stretch it out about this far. I've had him do that so many times. I've told Mary, I said, I think that money was made out of rubber because it just keeps on going when it shouldn't. I've seen her pray, and, and, and Steffi has the same anointing. They'll go someplace, come back with a car load, and it was all 90% off. I'm thinking, I, I don't do that because I get satisfied with retail. Not anymore. I, I want that rubber money anointing make that stuff go further. See, that, there's an anointing for that. How many know women like that? They feel real good when they go shopping. You had enough for one little bag, you come back with six bags, you're going, yes! There's an anointing for that, mamas. Especially when you're trying to take care of your kids. God gives you an anointing to make that go further. You're living on social security. God gives you an anointing to make that go further. I love the anointing. God wants to release it in your life. It's available to you. Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask that you would just give us your grace to recognize and activate your anointing in our lives, that each one of us have an anointing to live, each one of us have an anointing to serve you and your kingdom. Father, let us come into that menorah to receive that anointing oil from our Messiah. And Father, let his lifeblood flow through us and let his wisdom flow through us so that we can be that light in the earth that's growing darker every day. Father, I thank you and I praise you for it this morning in Jesus' name.